Welcome to the Epcot and Cocoa Report. Today we are lucky to have Ben Recht on. Uh, uh, ben, Dr. Recht is a, a professor at uh, Berkeley uh, in computer science, uh, where he kind of where he specializes in machine learning. Um, and uh, as a side hobby, uh, dives deep into masking studies, <laughs> which is why he's here. <laughs> ben, welcome. Thanks, thanks Jalen. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so Ben, I so it was in, it was you know this is this is one of the great things about Twitter, right? Um, there's so many bad things about Twitter. <laughs> Twitter can totally destroy people's lives, That's right. you know. Um, but but wow, one of the great things about Twitter is that when the initial Bangladesh cluster mask randomized controlled trial came out, the trial to answer all the questions to definitively say what is the masks work? Do they not work? Um, you know, when that trial came out in September, early September. It was a it was reported as a positive trial. Now it's a it was a preprint. It was from the economic sphere. Um, it was a very large trial, uh, three hundred thousand uh, approximately individuals in Bangladesh. It's a cluster RCT because uh, they it was you know the unit of randomization was a village, not the individual, and so they basically randomized folks to uh, um, a, a a policy to increase mask usage versus whatever they were doing at baseline. And whatever they were doing at baseline was actually the government had a mandate for masks, but apparently, this is again from the paper, um, apparently it was not uh, that well enforced, uh, whatnot, and, um, and, you know, over time it was getting less and less, uh, I guess. And so they had this, pol they had this, you know, resources that were poured in to uh, educate, and they had cricket, cricket stars um, in, in, in certain villages uh, where they had this messaging to increase policy, uh, increase mask uh, uh, wearing. Um, and there's also reported, and it was reported as a, you know, pretty solidly positive trial. I think the, the folks at Yale, uh, the, the one who was on Twitter kind of pushing it uh, the most was uh, Jason Abeluk, who's a Yale, uh, I believe a Yale economist. Um, and uh, He was uh, the lead author, wasn't he? The, or, yeah, he's, or I think, first. I don't know if he was first author, or, but anyway, okay. he's one of the, yes, one of those, uh, one of the main authors. And so when it came out, I was, I was kind of stunned by the, well, the size of the effect that was kind of, they were positing based on the headlines. Because my general feeling, you know, I, you know, I, wore, I put a mask on very, very early on, early on in the pandemic. Um, but my general feeling was that community masking for like any significant extended period of time maybe has a small effect, but you know, who knows? And I was, I was interested, I was, I was surprised to see the, the way they were talking about it. And so, um, so I started, so I, that's when I started looking and I was like, well, okay, fine. What was, what was the actual number? Because I realized pretty quickly that reading the top line stuff was they were, they were giving you relative risk reductions. And I was like, all right, well, what was the actual reduction in symptomatic cases in the treatment arm versus the control arm? And that's where you and I, <laughs> you and I found each other <laughs> because I, I put out a little thread saying that, you know, looking at the raw numbers, um, the, you know, that they've put out, it seems like that the actual case difference between the treatment and control arm is really, really, really small, which then makes you wonder about, well, do you want to really extrapolate to one, the entire group, and then to the, you know, to the rest of the world. Um, and, and, and uh, the interesting thing that we both kind of <laughs> concluded in September, and we kind of let it go was that, well, the raw data just is not out there. The, you know, the, 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 the endpoint that the trial had, which was if you had COVID like symptoms and there was a certain category, you couldn't just have like, you know, diarrhea and have COVID. There were certain symptoms. One of them was anosmia, one of them was fever, cough, et cetera. You had to have a certain number of symptoms in order to be considered COVID symptomatic. And then you also had to have serology that was positive for COVID. So a blood test that basically showed, you know, some antibodies for COVID. So the two things together was the primary endpoint in this Bangladesh cluster RCT of 300,000 people. And it's a simple question. You know, when you do RCTs, RCTs are generally, <laughs> we want to know what is the, how often does the primary endpoint happen in the treatment arm? And how often does the primary endpoint happen in the control arm? And the fascinating thing in the paper was that that number, those numbers were not listed. <laughs> we were left to try to decipher it after the fact. Right. So, so finally we get to, we get to three days ago, I get this direct message from some guy named Ben. I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was you saying that, hey, Anish, you know, uh, we, we talked about this before. You, you, you had come up, you had kind of backward computer that you thought the case difference was 15, which is 
again, really ridiculous, right? I mean, yeah. think about it. At the time, it was like, are you, are you kidding? There must be something wrong. 15 case difference. That was the number of cases out of a 300, you know, in a 300,000 trial. And you're going to say these really, really firm things. But then we let it go because, of course, there was no raw data. It's like, all right, maybe we're getting something wrong. Who knows? You somehow have been tracking this and you were on it when the Yale researchers, you know, thankfully, and thanks, thanks to them for doing the work, they actually released the raw code and the data on, on Gitmo. Uh, Gitmo, am I getting that right? GitHub. GitHub. <laughs> GitHub. GitHub. Oh, Gitmo is. <laughs> Gitmo is, I don't know what Gitmo is. Gitmo is in Guantanamo. Oh, wait, oh, that's right. That's what Gitmo. Oh, man. The, the oh, data man, jail, the data prison. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. GitHub, yes. So they they released Git they released the data to GitHub from Guantanamo, where yeah. it was jailed before. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you you crunched uh, you crunched the numbers. You know, requires you can't just open it up and look at tables. You have to you know run some code, right, and uh, whatnot. Yeah. It turns out, it turns out at the end of the day you can just open it up and look at tables. But oh, it, okay. was, it was not obvious from the README file how to do that. Uh, I had to do oh, a okay. little bit of digging first. I see. But yeah, that there is a file in there in and and. The biggest problem is that you can only read the, it looks like you can only read the file if you have a software pro package called Stata, uh, okay. which is what the economists use. But it turns out you can read this in R and Python as well. So I think okay. that, that's also useful to people. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so you, so, so go ahead. So tell so what did you, you know, what, what did, uh, what mean, did you find? Really all I did was I wanted those numbers. Um, uh, as you said, right. Um, they have a table where they talk about the number of, participants, the number of people who consented to survey, the number of people who actually they, they actually followed up with. You know, these are all standard things that you would see in a clinical trial about censoring, what have you. They, they listed how many people blood they tested, how many people consented to blood tests. And then they never told you how many blood tests that, uh, were positive. Like that's always what you will see in a standard uh, you know, just paper in JAMA or New England Journal, right? That's what you would expect. They left off the last line. So I wanted that last line. It took a little bit of sleuthing, but at the end of the day, you can just get it from, they have, you could compute that number from this table, which you just run a cross tabulation uh, of uh, the, they have a, one, one of the columns in the table is how many, if, if a person tested positive and had symptoms, um, and then they have all the clusters. And so you could just, you could just run it. Um, yeah. And so the difference was 20. Uh, you so you're very close. <laughs> <laughs> so 20 cases. So just to go over what you said, yeah. um, there were 100. Uh, and actually, and it's interesting that the numbers, the numbers, the numbers in the preprint, yeah. the exact numbers are they differ widely in various yeah. different places. Correct. So, but if, anyway, approximately 170,000 people in the treatment villages, approximately 160,000 in the control villages, right. and then. The number of people, and this just shows how hard it is to, to do these trials. So, you know, again, kudos to the folks that try to do this. Uh, you yeah. know, it's easy for, you know, Twitter warriors to sit on. No, exactly. <laughs> sit on yeah. a Saturday and be like, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. But my God, this must be so incredibly hard. So, you know, yeah. again, uh, you know, props to them for attempting this. Um, but just, I mean, that doesn't mean that they're immune to criticism. I mean, the part of, part yeah. of what makes it hard is, is, is it's hard. But I mean, I think, out of well, I think we should emphasize that, though. I mean, I think this is yeah. the thing that we, I think it's very important to emphasize. And th this is true in um, empirical economics and it's true in medicine is that you know trials are incredibly difficult and we really want to we don't want to be doing less i don't think we want to be doing fewer trials um but unfortunately the you know are um it's very hard if you're very invested in a trial to admit that you have a null effect and i think right. that's the problem I, I really do think that the authors went into this yeah. project with good intentions and i'm really happy someone did this but can it's wanna, just hard right. to step back and say uh, it was a null effect. Can one yeah. of you describe a little bit, uh, you know, for yes. the audience, not, you know, the, really the actual design of the, yeah. of the experiment? I, uh, you know, it was, it was actually, so 600 villages, if I understand correctly. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Go you ahead. want me to, want yeah. me to try yeah. that? Go ahead, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's not so bad. Um, so there were 300 villages that were identified using a very complex procedure and then by a matching procedure where they tried to match based on demographics. Mm -hmm. And and then um, so they came up with 300 pairs of villages in Bangladesh that were distributed in some particular way had appropriate demographics. After they made that matching of 300, they randomly assigned one to a control and one to treatment. What is treatment in this case? Treatment is very very complicated. Treatment required, um, as, as Anish was saying, there was a variety of randomized treatments. Uh, some of the groups were randomized to wear purple cloth masks. Some of the groups were randomized to wear red uh, cloth masks. Some were randomized to wear green. 
surgical masks. Some were randomized to uh, wear blue surgical masks. So even inside the, the treatment, there was a lot of other randomization. Uh, some villages were randomized such that the village uh, leader uh, had a financial incentive to increase masking, right? I mean, there, there's, there's a very, very complicated protocol uh, in, inside of this. There was education program. Uh, the control villages just had people come through, do some surveillance, but tried to be as minimal of a surveillance as possible. So they asked some people to, um, you know, you know, some households to actually fill out surveys. And then subsequently, if some people tested positive, households in both communities were tested for serology. But I think the, uh, the, one of the really striking things, if you look at the paper, is the response rate in the control group is much lower than the response rate in the treatment group. And in fact, that difference alone is much larger than the observed difference in uh, serology. So it's, it's a, I don't know, it's very, it's a complex, it's a difficult design, but um, again, you know, I, I don't, I don't know your audience, but I'm assuming it's medical folks. Sure. And um, you know, I, I think, I, I think all, you know, people who work in um, uh, the medical sciences know that uh, unblinded trials always tend to, you know, you always tend to see some kind of placebo effect. Right. And if, if the placebo effect gives you a risk reduction of 0.9, which is what they saw in the paper, uh, I mean, it's hard to rule out that it was just placebo effect. So, and then again, the, the, um, the, the villages were randomized to, to the intervention versus control, and then the yeah. intervention, and then there was a, yeah. it was an eight-week observation period, uh, right? Yes. Eight week, and then eight weeks. Eight weeks right. uh, and then the end point was so, uh, symptomatic COVID with uh, positive yeah, serology. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. The, the, and, and again, the, the end point was ser positive serology. They had a few different times when they checked for the serology and did blood draws. Okay. So it was that you, at some point before the end line, there was that person both, you know, they wanted to have people who had symptoms and sent it to serology and tested positive, but, yeah. which is also a very complicated sure. diagnostic. Right. Right? The interesting thing is, is that, um, you, you know, you weren't able to, and I can just describe, this is just the, 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 uh, the, the problems with pragmatically doing something like this, right? If you right. have a primary endpoint, which is symptomatic seropositives, then, you know, you'd want to be, you want to be able to get as many blood samples as you can from this 300,000 group. Unfortunately, right. you know, of the 170,000 people approximately that were in each group, um, the, you know, the, the number of people who had symptoms, about 13,000 in each group, the number of then samples they ended up collecting was about 5,500 in each group. Okay. So, so you can see the problems here. I mean, you, you know, you're going from 170,000 people in each group and you're only able to collect samples right. from approximately 5,500 folks. And then of those, you know, if you, you have to throw out a bunch, which there's some problem in collecting them or it doesn't run right or something like that. Right. right. So then you're left with 5,000. So you're left with 5,000 in, uh, individuals that you have the combination of what their symptoms were yeah. and what their uh, 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 you serology. know what, mm -hmm. and their serology, whether it be That's positive right. or negative, right? So, so, um, so that right there, I mean, you know, <laughs> is a little bit is a little bit uh, is a little problematic. So right. that last line is what you know Ben, it, Ben, you know Ben noticed uh, along with uh, others that that last line of okay, so you had five thousand that you tested. How many of those were positive in treatment, and how many of those were positive in the control arm? And and that's the part that Ben, you know, that uh, that uh, you know Ben uh, susses out here that they were in the in the control arm. Um, there were 1,106 symptomatic seropositives, and in the treatment arm, there were 10,086 such. 1,086. 1,086. Sorry, yes. 1,086. Sorry. So which is which is a difference about of 20 cases. And then they then have to go. Then of course this is only in the, those 5,000 though. So then they have to then go and extrapolate that 20 to, you know, for 20 out of this 10,000, uh, you know, where they have the samples, right? Yeah. They then have to extrapolate that somehow to the 300,000. Can, uh, can I just say, Anish, and yeah. I think this, this is now again, where uh, there's this distinction between the statistical metho methodology and uh, econometrics as in, in medicine. Like in medicine, we could at this point just run a T-test. Right. Or, or a Z-test. It's a huge sample. We run a Z-test. And then you would run a Z-test where you would count for intracluster correlation and then you would test the p-value. You don't have to do anything. Once I give you, once you give me right. the serology numbers, we could do a z-test. And um, right. I actually did it. I th I think the design effect is at least five, and you guys could disagree or agree with me about that. Um, I just did a couple back of the envelope calculations, and I read some ANOVAs, and I think it's at least five. I think it's more than five. But I think five is generous. And if it's five, the p-value of the difference, um, you know, it, it, like. 
or sorry, well, let me step back one more time. So I mentioned earlier that the treatment group had more people responding than the control group. Mm -hmm. So actually the, so uh, Anish said it was like 170,000 people in the, who responded in the treatment group, only 150,000 in the control group. It was a smaller number. Right, right. So, so if you actually look at the prevalence ratios, you know, or like you do some kind of extrapolation, you would see that the, you know, the, the, the observed effect looked like it was 1.1, right? I mean, that, that's roughly the or risk reduction or 0.9 okay. relative right. risk. So if you now run the Z-test with a design effect of five, the P-value for that difference is point, I think 0.14. Okay. So, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know what you make of that, right? Like if it's the, so that, that doesn't, I don't think 0.14, I mean. Which is, a, but the P-value that they reported yeah, the p-values that they report are very complicated. Okay. Um, and so that's it. So let's go into that. So this is our, let me just, sorry, just to be, I, right. yeah, go I'm ahead. excited. Go ahead. So I yeah. think I'm going too quickly with this. So again, if I just run a standard Z test and I account for a design effect, and I'm very generous in saying that design effect is small, it's just five, mm -hmm. then the p-value is like 0.14. That's not statistically significant. Um, now they have all sorts of stuff that they're claiming is statistically significant because they're economists. The way econometrics people do this is you fit a model and then you read off asymptotic numbers that are supposed to be p-values for assuming that the model is true. Mm -hmm. But it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. This is the sort of thing, I think this is another cultural difference. If you look at if every JAMA or New England Journal paper I've read, it says, here's the primary endpoint. Maybe I'll give you a secondary endpoint. I'll give you the p-values on those. And then there will be a section that they call exploratory endpoints. And then they do some modeling and you get the charts with like the hazard ratios mm -hmm. for all the different characters. This is, but they, they, I think everybody is pretty clear. This is exploratory. Maybe you do another experiment and in, econ in economics, they don't care. They just do everything. They test hundreds of hypotheses. They never correct for them. And then whichever ones are small, they put stars next to whichever have small P values. They put stars next to in their tables. Those are the ones that they call significant. Right. This is a cultural difference. Uh, I strongly object to that as someone who has been brought up in a very, I, I don't know, my version of pragmatic statistics does not, I, I mean, I just, I just assume that everything in those tables is wrong, but this is the way that uh, econometrics works. That's funny. You know, I, I just want to mention that uh, and draw the attention of the audience. Um, I did an episode with, uh, Anish wasn't there, but with uh, Peter Klein, an economist, last year on the occasion of the, uh, the Nobel Prize um, in economics being awarded to um, the people who introduced RCTs to econometrics. Yeah. And so we dissected a little bit that, you know, the whole history and, and whatnot it was very interesting. So it was episode 97 oh, and I'll, cool. I'll put that on the show notes. Um, yeah, so, go ahead, Anish. Yeah. So, you know, we have not heard, uh, well, I should say that we haven't heard from the researchers about about you know about about these uh, about about these raw numbers and uh, it, it, it's interesting. I just find it interesting that there were such um, strong opinions that arose from a trial like this where the you know the differential was so small. Um, why why do you think that is, uh, Ben? I I mean I feel. I do not understand the obsession with masking. I think this got, got to be incredibly emotional and personal and people just wanted to think this works. But I do feel like it's, it's kind of obvious. It was obvious to me in March of 2020 that it wouldn't work, that it was a complete waste of everyone's time. Now, why? And again, this is, see, I, I'm emotional. I'm saying obvious to me. Why was it obvious to me? So in, I live in California. California has had a horrible drought and horrible wildfires for the past several several years. And when we started having these fires, people started investing in N95 masks because this was a way to like prevent you from doing smoke inhalation. But uh, at the time, all of the experts said that if you do not do a proper fit test, you may be causing more harm than good wearing these masks because they leak through the sides. And immediately, you know, when COVID starts and people start talking about, you know, oh, we're going to wear N95s. I'm like, okay, we went, I went through this already. I was already told that that's actually kind of a very tricky, you know, personal protective equipment is tricky, requires training, cannot be worn for extended periods of time and so on. Uh, now we're gonna do this everywhere and it's going to work. And 
you know, at the beginning, you're like, fine, we'll do it for a while. But it devolved into some kind of craziness. Uh-huh. I, I, I'll never get it. I'll never understand why it devolved into. So I think there are people now who believe that wearing a piece of cloth on your face is more protective than getting vaccinated. And that's a shame. I mean, that's a failure. Right. It's a failure of public health. And, and that's all, all the, right. It's all the more interesting um, in that, uh, you know, the, the mask mandates and so forth were uh, instituted um, before the Bangladesh study, right? Okay. So, I mean, we had so, so, and, and just to be clear, the Bangladesh study was con- conducted between November 2020 and April 2021, if I understand correctly. That's so this one. So, it's, uh, and and that that has relevance because the epidemics in the epidemic in Bangladesh, you know, followed a certain course and and whatnot, which has relevance to whether we can apply the results to other other places and so forth. But um, uh, which means that there really, I mean, there was no way to justify uh, to have any kind of of there was nothing to justify the strength of the opinions about masks. Uh, it's very you odd. Know, it's, I, mean, I think, it, right. Okay, so I, I do know, let me, let me be fair to some of the people I know who advocated it, or at least I, I've talked to people who I think are brilliant, who, who really believed in the mask intervention. And I think, you know, there's this disconnect for people who have never looked at medical science, where it's like, okay, look, it's so plausible that this has to work. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, there was like Scott Alexander, who I know a lot of people like, and I'm one of my favorites, but whatever. He, he really, he was one of the first people to bring up the notion that like, you know, I don't need to wear I don't need to do an RCT of a parachute, but you know, the, the effect size of a parachute is infinite, right? <laughs> it's like really, really large, it's effectively infinite. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, you don't have to do RCTs when the effect size is obvious. Um, well, and I think the other thing that's difficult, I mean, your listeners probably know this, but most medical interventions don't work. Yeah, but you know, the psychology is interesting because uh, I think, you know, they go on the basis of the, uh, the, the me- mechanistic plausibility of having right. a barrier, right? So there's a barrier. Right. And then they say, well, we don't know the effect size, but it, it really can't be, you know, it, it's better than nothing. I mean, it, right. it can't be, uh, it, it can't harm you. Although, All right. I mean, I, I think people can argue that actually maybe it, it does change behavior. And so it, it could be harmful. But I think it's, it's just a very, um, it's a way of thinking very mechanistically about, about these things. Uh, but it's, I, I agree with you. It's, it's really bizarre. It's really yeah, bizarre, yeah. especially since it had been, I mean, there had been studies on masks for, <laughs> for decades, for decades, for decades I mean, and they were all yeah. inconclusive or, or at best, you know, yeah, and yeah. most of them negative and whatnot. Yeah. Well, I mean, I honestly had no idea what the, I mean, from a, from a healthcare worker standpoint, going into hospitals, you know, I mean, droplets all over the place, you know, these things get carried on droplets. Fine. I mean, yeah. and you have nothing else to do. What do you do as a healthcare worker sitting in March of 2020 with this thing that's coming at right. you that you don't know what the IFR is, you don't know how, what the mortality is, you're watching colleagues get super sick. Look, so I mean, you know, I, I think, um, you know, masks in healthcare settings, um, maybe, uh, you know, a totally different. And plus, we're much more careful with masks. And oh, well, <laughs> we used to be much more careful with masks yeah. in healthcare settings. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about now, now that we have to wear them all over the place. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I, let's I'm talk about that. And let's, let me actually try to be the devil's advocate here. Because in, in the study here, the Bangladesh study, they had two yeah. kinds of masks. You mentioned cloth mask and surgical masks. Yeah. And then they showed, you know, it's a little bit like a, a dose, <laughs> dose ranging effect, right? Yeah. So the surgical mask allegedly yeah. had a better effect. Can yeah. you speak to that? Is that, is that something yeah. we can hang our hat on uh, that the, I'll, I'll, the surgical I'll masks were better? Yeah, go no, ahead. I'll say this once you, and I, I will, I'll send this to you. I, I'm going to write a follow-up blog post. That I think no one will read where I do the nitty gritty statistical analysis that accounts for design effect. Mm-hmm. Not a single thing in this paper. Once you account for multiple hypothesis testing and design effect is statistically significant. So right. fine. But now let's throw, I also believe very strongly that like the, all these conversations about statistical significance are basically just like, scientific gish I mean, it's just like a way to throw crap at people and then people throw crap back at you. Right, right. Who knows? Uh, let's just look at the effect size. The, the, they have, a, that, as, I, as I mentioned, a very complex treatment with lots of sub-randomization to try to get at multiple arms. You know, they didn't correct for that either. I mean, you have, your power goes down as you add more treatments. Mm-hmm. Like you, can, mm-hmm. you can't just like, mm-hmm. you can't just like treat everything like an independent RCT. They had four different kinds of masks two cloth masks, red and purple, two surgical masks, green and blue. Washable, reusable, right? Yeah, it's just exactly, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. what it turns out is that uh, if you group the red and the purple together, uh, they had a very marginal effect size. It was a very small improvement. Uh, it was like a, a 7% effectiveness versus the surgical mask, which had a 12% effectiveness. Again, for me, that means neither of them worked, but fine, the numbers were bigger. But what's funny now is we unbreak them, we have four. The red masks 
had a higher effectiveness than the oh, surgical mask oh, I see. <laughs> and the purple masks didn't do anything. Right. And so now you're just like, well, <laughs> so clearly we should be wearing red cloth masks. <laughs> that would be the conclusion. And no, we can't make that conclusion. So I don't know. No, I, you know, I, I think you've identified. So, right. So, so saying, saying, saying surgical masks are better than cloth masks based on this is again, it's a very, yeah. very, no, there's no evidence. There's, yeah, it's a very no yeah, it's a very iffy proposition. Yeah. But that's kind of what's been unmasked, I think. And and yeah. uh, for <laughs> folks that no are no pun intended, right? <laughs> <laughs> for folks, for folks that are um, that have been a little bit in the weeds of econometrics, yeah. right? There's actually been a controversy in the field of economics about econometrics, right? Correct. Um, you know, Ed Lemer, who I yeah. I know you know, yeah. uh, wrote a uh, paper in 19. 1980s, 1980s. I'm pretty sure. 83, 83 right? Yeah. A famous, a famous paper. The title is "Taking the Con Out of Econometrics," right? Yeah. And he, he. I mean, it's almost like this. Oh, by the way, we had Ed Lemer on um, oh, cool. because, because partly to talk about, you know, I was getting sick and tired of health pol economists coming up with health policy. You know, these same very strong recommendations yeah. based on Not things much. that I, I'm sure just don't work. But yeah. like, they're like, no, no, no. This is definitely this shows it, and here's this paper, yeah. and it's all this. Yeah. econometric stuff that that, yeah. that they have and then it's probably why we brought ed lemer on to talk yeah. about yeah. this whole the con of econometrics and he talks about exactly what you're talking about which is the fact that like people are being way too certain based on you know a a, a statistical approach that uh, is basically you're fashioning it to get to the conclusion that that's you right. want yeah that's right. and you're not you know so there's these are very 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 fragile no, fragile right. results that you know you change the assumption here change the assumption there and suddenly you get you know a very different uh a different uh outcome a different yeah. uh, conclusion um so uh, again uh, you know i think what's been uh, what what is what should be clear to large swaths of the public is is that a lot of the things that is coming out of com that are coming out of you know econ that uh, econometrics um need to really really be taken with a uh, with a grain of salt um, I, I agree with that. Let me. I have a couple things I'd like to follow yeah. up with on that, because um, I, I, I like again. Yeah. Wrote this forty years ago, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, a more recent. So the more recent trend, uh, as as Michelle pointed out, was moving from purely econometric modeling to RCTs, and the RCTs are supposed to fix this because you know everyone likes to call those a a, a gold standard of causal inference. Um, a, a, I don't agree with all of it, but there's an excellent critique by uh, uh, this economist, uh, Angus Deaton, that RCTs aren't perfect either. I think right. everybody also in medicine knows RCTs aren't right, perfect. For sure. if, you, if you don't have, if you know, you, there are all these kinds of places where bias can creep into an RCT too. Just because you randomize doesn't mean you actually did a good experiment, right? I mean, there's a lot of other stuff you have to do. And just because you saw a small effect doesn't mean that effect actually, you know, that you actually discovered a causal link. Uh, or, or, or a reasonable design. Like, I think that's the other thing that we always forget with RCTs. You may have found a causal effect, but it might, doesn't necessarily lead to a new treatment. You know, I think there's a, it's very, it's very tricky. Um, right. And it's funny, right. right? I mean, like, you know, my favorite thing to come back to is vaccines. I always, I mean, these vaccine studies are incredible. Um, vaccination was discovered without a randomized control trial. You know, I mean, Ed, right. Ed Jenner was just looking at right. milk dates. Was, no, you you are you are uh, speaking to the choir. We are we are, we are big uh, we are big proponents of uh, yeah. But but that's why I mean, were you? Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here because you started both of you uh, giving kudos <laughs> to the to the designers of the study for trying yeah. uh, to conduct this clinical trial and saying you know you said uh, Ben that you don't want to discourage people from doing more randomized clinical trials. I think doing these trials is insanity to begin with. It's insane. Oh. It's insane to run a 300,000 uh, okay. patient trial. Okay. To, to, it, okay. it is, right? Okay. I mean, it's so, from the so get-go. Go okay. All right. Now, that's actually really good. Now, I want to dive into this. Now, I get, I'm going to get above my real soapbox because I've been trying to tell people this forever. Um, one of my favorite quotes of all time about science is uh, this physicist, Ernest, Ernest Rutherford. And I think it's apocryphal, but I'm still going to give him credit for it, where he said that if your experiment need statistics, you ought to have done a better experiment. And, right, I, and, right. He's, and he's, he's right. And I think we could carry that down to this business with cluster randomized trials. Um, I know there are a lot of evidence-based folks out there who really believe that you have to do an RCT and cluster RCTs are better than nothing. But you know, with a cluster RCT, you're, you're, you're gonna have to blow up your, your power calculation. Your standard power calculation, you know, it scales with the, how, how much you think it's going to vary. And then you have to multiply it by your design effect mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. a cluster ICT. And, you know, there's this paradox that people just in the, 
RCT proponents don't admit to, which is that that variance, which is governing your sample size, grows as the uh, as your uh, effect size goes down. Because if your like if your power calculation says you need a thousand, and you're doing that in a hospital, you know that could be a two or three hospital uh, study, and you know you have maybe with a dozen people managing the data, controlling stuff. Now, if it's 10,000 or 30, or like a vaccine trial, 60,000, how many people were involved? How many different places could you introduce error in a vaccine trial? How much money is that going to cost? So many different systematic sure. errors appear as your effect size grows. And now, you know, I did a power calculation for the Bangladesh study. You know, it seems like it's like 2 million people would have maybe made it reasonably powered to detect a 1.1% difference, uh, risk reduction. But that's crazy. Like, how are you right. going to handle right. the complexity of it? I mean, uh, Anish noted that you look through the paper, there are so many different versions of 300,000. Like, how do we actually know that they got the numbers right? Like, you got to be so perfect to find these small effect sizes. So your variance increases as your study size increases. And so I completely agree with you, Michelle. I think we should be, we should want to do more studies. But when we do a power calculation and it says 100,000, or obviously if it says a million, that means you really ought to go back and think about what you're trying to say. Right. I'm going to I'm going to quote um, a, a blogger. I'm not going to give his name, except that okay. I hear he, he's, a, he's a podcast co-host now. Yeah. Okay. But in, in 2011, he, he gave a law. Uh, the clinical value of a randomized control trial is inversely related to its size. Oh, wow. So uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, oh, wow. I mean, if you have right, I mean, if you yeah. have uh, um, yeah. right, I mean, 300, I mean, how, how could it possibly have any clinical yeah. value if you need Two million people to run a clinical trial yeah. to to get your 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 answer, and especially now. So I, I mentioned that it was conducted over over during a pandemic over a six month period when when you're going to have waves. You were changing waves of infection in the in the which is going to be a prime determinant of of the effectiveness of your intervention. Yeah. Is, you know what what the prevalence of the the infection yeah. is in on the. I, so, I guess my, my yeah. question would just be, I mean, so there are two, there are two takeaways I have, and I do really want to say, I want, I, I don't want people to stray away from, okay, actually, I have, let me, three points, three points there. I don't, I don't want people to stray away from randomization. I still think that as much limit as RCTs have, it's the best thing we've got. And I, I've talked to people who claim that observational studies have more external validity, and I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. It's like, you're always cherry picking in an observational study. So we have to randomize. But that said, that doesn't mean, as you said, we don't. We, we should think about if if the if our power calculation says n equals a million, probably we're not. We're look. We need to do a better experiment. We need to think about how to do a better experiment, or realize that intervention could even if you even if it works is useless. Or, or the, the right. That. Or the question is wrong to begin with. The yeah. question is wrong because if you answer yes. mask works, masks work. That's a nonsensical question. In fact, <laughs> many many of question many questions that are answered in randomized clinical trials tend to be nonsensical questions like that. Because it's oh, not what's an example in your mind. Uh, you know, I mean, even statins. You know, do statins work? Well, what does that yeah. mean? Uh, really, the real question is: Is it a good idea to give a statin to, you know, Joe Smith in front of me? Yeah. That's the the real important question. Is not yeah. statins working? You know, as an abstraction. Um, yeah. But but it turns these things into abstractions. So do masks work? You know, for whom, when, yeah. under what conditions, what kind of mask, all that stuff. And, and if you right. if you parse it that way, there's no way that you're going to, you know, be able to to yeah. muster a randomized trial to to answer those. Yeah. those I think those, right. I think, I think epistemology is, is very, very, very hard. I think knowledge creation is, 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 is yeah. difficult. I think, yeah. uh, you know, it requires like very deep content content expertise in, 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 in the field that you're in yeah. to try to parse out what what cause and effect is at the same time that deep. Uh, you know, being deeply in the weeds can also bias you to, to be, you know, uh, can affect your prior. So I think a lot, <laughs> so it's very hard. And, and I think this is something uh, we've, or I've been writing about for some time. And, you know, uh, the EBM guys get very upset with me because I keep showing, I keep showing these like parachute like effect sizes, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and in hindsight, it's obvious, you know, it's like uh, putting a stent in for somebody that's having an acute MI, right? Or, uh, or the ECMO trials that were run in, in little kids that, you know, uh, you know, uh, so there are all these things where, you know, um, clearly the folks that were uh, involved, like Thomas Starzl with transplant and immunosuppressant drugs, you know, he, he coined the phrase actually randomized trilomania because he was around when, you know, it was no longer 
are okay for some super smart, highly exalted person to be like, this works and everyone would do it. No, no, no. You had to prove to the FDA with RCTs that this would work. But Tom, you know, Tom Starzl wrote very eloquently about the fact that, well, if you're doing an RCT and I'm <clears throat> as a transplant surgeon, as a father of transplant, I'm sure that this drug is better than this drug because I've seen all these people fail on this, this regimen and not fail on this regimen. Again, not in an RCT, right? He's, he was saying that, look, this should be enough. And I think it's unethical to randomize these people. But no, the FDA forced you to randomize. Right. And when you did that, uh, you know, people suffered organ, uh, you know, or, uh, they rejected their organs. They, some of them even died. So um, it, is, it, is, it is very, very, very hard because how do you just take people's word for it? Because you can't just take people's word for it, right? If we were to take the word of the folks from Yale, <laughs> yeah. then, then we would just, we'd all wear masks forever and ever. Yeah, so yeah. It, is, it, is, it is incredibly hard. But, you know, perhaps this is the way you kind of muddle through. It's like doing the stuff. What I object to, though, mm-hmm. when I think you're right on in terms of what you're talking about early on, is and what Ed Lemer has been talking about since you know the 1980s, since we were running around in sixth grade, or Michelle was you know an adult at that, that time, but the rest of us. But <laughs> the, the, the you know what is that? Is that why there is no reason you have to change the culture in if this is the culture in econ- economics? Yeah, you cannot be this massively confident because right. of you know 10 pages of statistics and and Correct. literally the effect size is this. Right? right. What exactly what you're saying. So, right. it, and it, you know, so it, it kind of brings, brings Freakonomics, that whole, the freak, I mean, you know, Freakonomics is kind of based on this, right? That's right. It's, it's this idea that you can have these large data sets and you can come up with some statistical method and you can say, okay, crime rates are going down in the 1990s because right. abortion was made legal in the 1960s. I mean, that's literally said in Freakonomics. Yeah. And it's completely based on some econometric that's right. You know, thing that, you know, three people in the world may understand <laughs> and you just have to take their word for it. And, you know, That's people, right. we, we should, you know, the wider public needs to not just take their word for it. Well, uh, for to, all these things. Let me say, I mean, they back that up even more. I mean, I, I'm, I've been a bit dismayed by people who I know are very critical, smart individuals taking the taking any literal value from this study. Yeah. Like, they've right. got. I mean, like, you know, it's just it's you can't. I, right. I, I listened to a podcast yesterday where someone brought this up again and it's someone I, some, I mostly respect and I'm not going to name who that person is, but, you know, said that, you know, brought up the whole business about cloth, uh, surgical masks being better than cloth masks. Like it was a top line, but you can't, it's not true. It's just not true. Right. Like, no, I, right. We don't know right. anything. So, but, yeah. but you know, once it's published, then, then the, policy, the, poli- the politicians, the policy folks can just run with it. They can run with it. published. That's the it's best not part. It's a preprint. It's not published. It was a preprint. <laughs> okay. It's amazing. You just yeah. have to blog. I mean, that's why that's why right. I love my blog. I mean, I I really enjoy blogging. Um, I had someone ask me like, "Oh, you should." Well, I sent them an early draft, and they was like, "You should try put post this to bioarchive." Like, I don't want people to cite this. I don't <laughs> care about my H index, man. I just like I want people to read it. I want to try to make it clear, and you know, we can have a conversation, but it shouldn't be like so. A, what do you make of, well, take somebody that's well outside, somebody who actually, you know, uh, throws stones at these guys all the time, at the yeah. school folks or the economists, yeah. somebody like Nassim Nicholas Taleb, huh. right? So he is a big time mask proponent, right? Yeah. He's, he, I think he's still wearing a respirator right now. Wow. Um, but, <laughs> While doing deadlift, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> uh, deadlifting cars or whatever it is. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, Tesla's. Um, but what, so do you understand what, what his, his argument is, is like, you know, he would, the three of us, you know, hopefully yeah. he doesn't find this podcast because he'll, oh, he'll flame all of us. But yeah. um, <laughs> what, 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 is, what is his argument? Um, in terms of the exponential nature of risk and why we shouldn't we shouldn't even bother with this stuff like you, you guys are fools for trying to even dissect this um, you know r- risk is exponential and uh, you know g- you know get the f out of here I'm gonna put a mask on yeah I think I think um, okay to be clear I don't really fully understand like he ha- he puts out mathematical plots and there's some stuff in it and then he just rants and then he has- <laughs> <laughs> claims that he's proven something so i'm not sure i fully like you know and he'll probably get mad that he's like oh no i've proven this to be true my understanding and again this is probably wrong and Tal will probably come for me now my understanding is the idea that you know we all were obsessed at the beginning with um you know the r number of this disease is very high you know it's a it's a very contagious disease and so that causes exponential spread through a population and the idea is that if you could get your r below one then you would have you know a herd immunity effect and the infections would decay to zero this is, I think, the main idea. And so every little thing you could do, you know, clearly matters. And we shouldn't even ask questions. We should do everything possibly in our power. Um, 
I don't necessarily disagree, except for the fact that the, this just fails to realize that there are some things we can't control. And I think this is a huge problem with our society and obviously our medicalization of society. There are some things we can't control. We can't cure cancer. And honestly, for me, like most of this COVID stuff has actually, uh, my father's an oncologist. So I've actually been steeped in, uh, steeped in the cancer world for, for my entire life. And um, I think if you think about it, like if I gave 200 healthy people, uh, forced them to smoke a pack of cigarettes every day for the rest of their lives, they're not going to die at the same time. And so all these people who are comparing like COVID curves of different countries, it's kind of like comparing mm -hmm. like people who smoke and like saying, well, this guy was somehow, you know, whatever this one person did clearly mattered. And it's like, that's not how it works. It's variable. It's complex. And yeah, and just like with cancer, sometimes it runs out of control and there's nothing you could do. Um, so, so to me, this is this problem, like this idea that we have infinite amount of control, I think is foolish to go into to begin with. I think this is something that's very hard for us as humans to accept. But this is part of it, is that there are some things beyond our control. Um, but he, I think his... Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 actually, you, you this go idea, your... This idea that, like, just do, you know, you have this, this, this you know, R-naught of whatever, yeah. you, have, you have, you know, societal catastrophe that can happen, societal yeah. collapse that can happen, as happened in Delhi, as happened in, I guess, in New York City, uh, you know, Italy, Lombardy. Um, so do everything, even if there's a possibility of a small amount of success yeah um i mean at, at the beginning i guess that makes sense and it's okay you know it was two weeks to flatten the curve um but if yeah. you're, you're you're saying that this is now going to be some kind of permanent thing and it's pretty clear that it doesn't work yeah. eventually you just stop right yeah. i mean eventually when do we come to, when do we admit that it stops the other thing i would point out that's wrong with this argument is um people love to say well if i have you know if i stack a bunch of 10% interventions on top of each other, I'm eventually going to get to a 95% intervention. Right. And that's just right. wrong. Mm -hmm. That's just that it doesn't mm -hmm. follow. And this is the same problem with RCTs. RCTs matter on context. So if you get a risk reduction, let's even say you get a risk reduction of 50% in a particular population, or, or, or you get two, you do two RCTs, two different things, they each have a 50%. That doesn't mean you combine them and you get 75%. Because if you do a trial now where you do both interventions, maybe you also get 50%. And we don't know. The RCT doesn't tell us. And so extrapolating risk right. reduction from multiple things, you know, there's this, um, there's this really terrible analogy that bugs the crap out of me. That's the uh, Swiss cheese model. We don't know. We've never done a Swiss cheese model. So even if you look at individual interventions, um, we don't know how many holes there are. It could very well be that there's one hole that's perfectly aligned that goes right down the middle of all the interventions. Um, I think that's like a, one of Murphy's laws is redundant yeah. systems fail together. Right. So, uh, you yeah. know, again, it's this, this very mechanic, mechanistic way of thinking about things, which, you know, first of all, they, they, the only people who, who, um, who, um, you know, stake their entire sort of, uh, uh platform on, on these ideas, um, just narrow things down to just one outcome or two out, right. Yeah. I mean, they're, and that's yeah. because that's the only way you can think about things mechanistically and otherwise, but it, otherwise, if you think about it the way they are in reality, it, it's. It's holistic. It's much more complicated. I mean, things interact with one another all the time. Yeah. Things change all the time. I mean, then nothing stays the same and whatnot. And um, so, right. yeah. So, so it's interesting. You know, the general. I'm sorry to to stay on this for a little bit, but oh, okay. the general precautionary principle, right? Uh, I'm reading. Um, uh, I'm reading. I'm quoting um, Yanir Baryam and Nassim Nicholas Taleb and Joseph Norman. Um, the general precautionary principle delineates conditions or actions that must be taken to reduce risk of ruin and traditional cost-benefit analysis must not be used. These are ruin problems where over time exposure to tail events leads to a certain eventual extinction. Um, so while there's a very high probability of hum humanity surviving a single such event, over time there's eventually zero probability of surviving repeated exposure to such events. Now I read that, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. If we keep doing PCR on people and we keep locking down, we will become extinct. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's fair too, right? Fair too. But, but clearly, you know, they're writing this and reading this. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. They're right. They're right. They're writing this, and they, they. I mean, they view this as if we don't, I don't know what, mask and do whatever, we will become extinct. So they're saying, yeah, stop doing any type of risk benefit calculations. I, so, but that's super weird. I mean, I think it was evident in March of 2020 that this was not as bad as the Spanish flu. It was obvious already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we had let it run its course, it would have sucked. I, I, I do think that a lot of the interventions we took, you know, trying to do some risk management, trying not to have our over our hospitals overrun, I think they were prudent. 
you know, I don't, I don't want to say that, like, you know, I, I think in the face of uncertainty, you do a bunch of stuff, you try your, your damnedest, but you know, the Spanish flu killed like 5% of the global population. It was right. crazy. Right. It was crazy. And, and yet, and yet it was much less of a psychological scar Completely. Well, on we people. Had this, we had this giant world war happening at the time. So yeah, could, well, actually we it came at the, it came after <laughs> afterwards. I mean, it yeah. came at the tail end of the, of the first world war. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not in the history book. People, you know, kids don't he, read yeah. American history and, and, and yeah. then there's a huge chapter on the tragedy of the flu pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Whereas now, I'm sure that people are going to be writing about this COVID. I mean, if it yeah. ever ends, right? <laughs> the, 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 uh, the psychological scar, the existential threat of this thing. Yeah. And it's so clearly amplified by our own fears and our own, yeah. our own insanity here. It's amazing. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. I think it's, it's, we're in this weird place where, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're all relatively, I think uh, most of the people who, you know, uh, we're part of it. We're on Zoom. Um, right. We're kind of comfortable and we live in a pretty right. good thing. And then you start to, you create, I don't know, you just got to create something scary just to keep yourself going. No, I, mean, yeah. I don't want I mean, to minimize it. Lots of people have right. died and it sucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think we're going to look back on this. I think this is going to be very interesting in retrospect, which which was actually a, uh, uh, a more, um, in terms of quality, in terms of years of life lost, in terms of, you know, quality, when you actually really start to analyze it, which, which pandemic was worse, COVID or AIDS? And I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, HIV is also, was a horrible pandemic and it killed, you know, I mean, what, what, what's the, the death count now is 50 million, possibly more over, over two mm. decades. I mean, it's a lot of That's people. interesting, interesting point. Right. So, I mean, and, yeah. and, We've kind of we've memory hold HIV. That's weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah. At the very least, look. I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. We, we get put in the COVID. We're all put in the COVID minimizer camp. And I mean, COVID yeah. is bad. Yeah. You know, Michelle and I are physicians. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, have gone into a hospital almost every single day <laughs> yeah. in the last, you know, last two yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you know, see COVID patients and recognize yeah. that there's just us, just the family yeah. members, yeah. just uh, just elderly patients. So there's. All of those things exist. It's a it's a virus that seems to be circulating. That's that's you know a virus that you would uh, it, uh, not want to come into contact with on a, unvaccinated. Whether it be you, whether it be yeah. like like you know I, I we all I mean I think most of us that are reasonable you know uh, under understand that. Right. It's just uh, I, I think I've been most fr frustrated by the by what you channeled earlier. This idea that that if we do, if we if we do this beautiful dance, you know, yeah. this choreographed thing, and, yeah. and it's choreographed by like you know the the most dimwitted among amongst us who have you know ascended the chain of bureaucracy and and you know arrived at some you know a public health appointed position, like those are the ones choreographing. Great, right. <laughs> like like right. they can barely figure out like you know whether or not to uh, you know how to how to how to pay for some basic thing, and they screw that up all the time. They're going to choreograph this beautiful dance which keeps a respiratory virus that's highly infectious more infectious than most things that we pump with in the last hundred years they're going to mm -hmm. somehow keep us safe if we just listen to what they say right. and the reality is is that you know there is there, it, there is not that much control unfortunately of this situation right. um, unless you do what the chinese did apparently and like weld people in their homes which again i think is on the table now <laughs> for for the omicron variant i'm sure that's going to be suggested soon but but in order to get the public to buy in in a democratic society, like China doesn't doesn't care about this. China's like, you know, f this. We're you know, you're you're being welded in your home and you are shutting down and you know, shoot to kill if you're out there. Like I don't care. We don't have to do any. <laughs> but in a democratic society, you have to get people to buy in. You have to get large swaths of the population to buy in. And the way our elite, our 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 party, you know, the the referencing the the Chinese Communist Party, our our party, the way our party of elites does that, is basically by creating scientific consensus in order to create scientific consensus they need these things published uh, and out there and the media out blaring it saying that masks you know masks are masks are going to stop this thing and everybody better mask and if you don't mask you're one of the bad people that is making this whole thing worse you know i mean you have rochelle walensky the cdc director you know going out there and saying that you know masks protect you you know reduce your risk of getting covid by 85 percent i mean they're manufacturing scientific consensus. And I think 
you know, um, I think they've done a huge disservice to them because yeah. because of, you know, folks like you are sitting out there, like <laughs> showing that, hey, this is 20 cases here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I think no one's going to take them credibly. I mean, yeah. you know, weaponized smallpox could be out there tomorrow, right? right. And the CDC right. director would be like, no, please stay in your home. And, right. and I'm sure half the population is going to be like, you know, uh, no, I don't believe you anymore. So yeah. and I, I think I we're going gonna... to- I would also like to say, which is also, I think, part of the issue, right? I mean- COVID minimizer also sometimes means that you're like a Trump loving Republican. It's very right. odd how we've made this bizarre yeah. dichotomy split. Cause for me, the thing that's most depressing about masks is it allows politicians to, to do something while not doing anything useful. Right. right. So we know there are policies. Like I, I followed all of these like harm reduction specialists, people who worked with HIV, you know, they're people like, I, 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 I like, I love reading these people on, I, I found them mostly on Twitter. And then I've read a bunch of their work since. And these are people like, you know, Muga Chevik or Stefan Baral or, or Monica Gandhi, right? These right. are very smart yeah. uh, people who, uh, Julia Marcus, people who have been based in public health for a long time who I think are really deep thinkers. And, you know, a lot of the things they suggest, you know, they say, sure, mask, but then let's provide paid time off. Let's provide uh, the capability to, for people to isolate, you know, and there's all these other services that we could do and we didn't do any of them. Like when right. LA, I, I saw that when Los Angeles had like a really bad outbreak last winter um the rather than the there was talk of building these isolation places for people to isolate and instead they didn't do that instead uh fairer who is their their public health officer said uh, you should just wear masks in your house right like, right come on right. guys like like yeah. I, I think that's what's depressing is like me i'm uh i mean i'll just admit to it i'm a I, I live in Berkeley. It's kind of obvious. I'm a very left wing guy. Like it's like like and like I think there are these left wing policies that you know. Unfortunately, I feel like the te the technocracy that I had so much faith in for so long kind of let me down. Like I was like, we have we know what we could do. You know, if this country had better universal health care, I think we'd probably be in a better situation. There's lots of things that, sorry, that I believe that I don't. I'm not putting on anybody else. That I think would make make our, make our situation better. And instead, we talk about things that probably don't do much. In this right, situation. right, right, right. No, the technocracy has all kinds of crazy ideas, kind yeah. of like 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 universal health care. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. We don't have to agree about all these things. <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. Um, you know, um, so this is a fantastic conversation, Ben. Thanks Thank so much for we kind of being on top of it. And uh, I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's it's really great. It, it's it kind of shows the power of. Uh, uh, you know of of, uh, of 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 networks and of social media yeah. in a positive way which is which is a good thing for for a change but i agree but yeah yeah i, I look forward to your post i've read uh, your older posts as well they're also great so we'll really have them on the show here. notes um yep. and please tell the audience what your your yes. twitter handle is uh it's uh it's a complicated it's, it's the way my name is pronounced so it's at ben Recht, but it's b-e-e-n W R E K T. I apologize okay. for the well, stupid handle. It's a, it's a long story behind that. We'll have it on the show notes as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all.